Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to our MLP COVID-19 Town Hall um, that will specifically focus on advanced care planning. Uh, my name is Danielle, and I am running tech on this webinar today. In just a moment, I'll be turning over this presentation to our panelists, but before that, I have a few housekeeping things I'd like to run through with everyone. Um, everyone is joined and muted. Um, if you have questions, please send those in the chat box at any moment. And um, if you encounter any technical difficulties, uh, please don't worry. This webinar will be recorded and will be made available on our website, which will, um, I will share in the chat box. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Ellen. Great, thanks Danielle and greetings everyone. This is Ellen Lawton, I'm a director of the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership and so uh, appreciative of our panelists today and uh, we'll get to that introduction, but just wanna remind folks that we do have, as many most uh, organizations do now, uh, a specific web page on COVID-19 resources for medical legal partnerships as well as a, um, uh, publication we put out last week about eight things every MLP can do right now to respond to COVID-19. So check that out and any of the resources that we talk about today are going to be posted uh, on that web page. Next slide. And uh, just to pop in your calendar, uh, we're running another town hall at the end of the month, which is about delivering tele-legal services during COVID-19. And we have some MLPs from rural and urban settings that are going to be sharing their insights and uh, best practices. So put that on your calendar. We'll get a registration link out to you. Uh, and then today's uh, topics for today's planning, advanced care planning town hall, you can see uh, right here what our agenda is. And uh, really grateful again for our uh, panelists. Um, First, we're going to hear from Rebecca Tadori uh, about the clinical context for advanced care planning right now. And then we'll hear from Sarah Hooper um, in terms of legal barriers uh, to remote execution and some solutions. And then we have a Q&A featuring uh, Rebecca and Sarah, as well as Randy Redkin from Legal Health in New York City. Um, and so we're going to spend about a half an hour on content and then leave plenty of time for Q&A. So, don't wait until the Q&A to submit your questions. We're happy to hear your questions ahead of time and then we can uh, share them with the um, panelists and uh, start to put together our uh, Q&A process as we go. Uh, so we definitely wanna hear from you, uh, not just questions, uh, but also practices, things that you're doing in your community that you might wanna have us share here in this webinar. Next slide. And our faculty, again, uh, really appreciate the time and effort uh, that they're taking to join us. Uh, Sarah Hooper at UCSF, Randy Ratkin at Legal Health, and Rebecca Sidori also at UCSF. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Rebecca to take it away. Next slide. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see my slide? My slide? Yep, looks great. Great, great. Thanks. Awesome. Um, well, I just want to say it's real. Uh, it's a real honor to be here today on National Healthcare Decisions Day. Um, and as Sarah knows, I am probably the biggest fan of MLPs, and I would say that the work has really directly impacted the quality of life of my own patients and people in my community. So I just wanna thank everybody on the phone today for all the work that you do. Um, and also just to thank Sarah for being such a great partner with me over, I think it's been over 10 years, um, and the work that Sarah has done on the UCSF UC Hastings um, Consortium. Um, and as you can see here, Sarah wears many hats, um, at UC Hastings um, and as the policy director for medical legal partnerships for seniors. Um, as just a quick intro about me, I'm a geriatrician and a palliative medicine physician. I have both an outpatient geriatric practice and an inpatient palliative care consult service. 
See if I can then can't slide. So today what we're going to be talking about is I'm just going to take a step back and talk a little bit about the clinical context of advanced care planning, the goals of it, and then how advanced care planning is maybe a little bit different during this COVID-19 crisis and tools that you can use right now to help your clients and patients. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and she's going to talk about legal barriers and some strategies, so common barriers in state laws, the status of pandemic orders, and strategies to help clients and patients. So what is advanced care planning? I think many of us sort of know, um, but I think it's always good to sort of start out on the same page. Um, this is a consensus definition that was pulled together from over 50 different experts, including Sarah. Um, to come up with a consensus definition, you will notice that it wasn't published until 2017. Um, and it took a long time that Sarah can attest to get everybody on the same page. But just so we're on the same page, um, advanced care planning is a process that supports adults at any age or stage of health and understanding and sharing their personal values, life goals, and preferences regarding current or future medical care. And the goal of advanced care planning is to help ensure that people receive the medical care that's consistent with their values, goals, and preferences during serious and chronic illness. And I think the things that you'll notice here are that advanced care planning is a process. It's not just a form. It's not just a one and done sort of situation. Here we go. So why is advanced care planning important? Well, we know from studies that it improves patient satisfaction with care. Uh, it improves um, reported quality of life. People who don't want some medic you know, medical procedures, they have less unwanted medical care that might be aligned with their wishes, and we're hearing less stress from surrogate decision makers. Um, and what are the advanced care planning realities? Well, we know that advanced care planning has increased over certain years, but I would say overall for the entire population, it has remained at about a third um, for the past 10 years. For older adults in some, um, I would say more um, affluent um, uh, groups, this is maybe up to about 50%, but I would say particularly among um, minority populations that has remained low around 15 to 20%. And when you actually look at whether or not people are discussing their wishes with medical providers, that's still quite low at 10 to 20%. Um, there was a recent study that was done looking at ICU decedents, and about 20% of people died in the ICU without having any advanced care planning or any documentation of goals of care in their medical records. And we take a step back and think about the COVID-19 clinical realities and sort of what's happening. I think, you know, you probably heard sort of in the news that initially people were saying, oh, um, you know, and as a geriatrician, I took offense at this, that this is only affecting older adults. Um, and I think people didn't take it seriously because of that, sadly, um, because of ageism and other things in our society. But I think if we're seeing that the reality is, is that the serious illness is affecting both young and old individuals. The median age is estimated to be 56 years. Um, the other thing that's interesting about it is that the clinical picture can worsen very quickly. And oftentimes people will get the illness, they'll actually be feeling better, and then things can change very quickly. Um, I think the other thing that's been very hard about this, um, especially for frontline providers and for families, is that families and surrogates, I'm sure if you heard, are not able to visit the emergency room or the hospital. And so I can attest to many of my colleagues in New York where people are rolling into the emergency room, sometimes not even without ID. They don't know who this person is. They don't know who to call. Nobody's ever seen them before. Sometimes they don't go to that hospital. They have no idea how to, you know, where to even start um, with trying to help this, these people and understand their wishes. Um, we are also, again, as a geriatrician, we're seeing that older patients are not bringing their hearing aids their glasses, or they may bring their cell phones, but they don't bring their charger. I can tell you that I worked with a patient who was in the ICU who was lucid and could speak for himself, which was, which was good, but we couldn't contact any of his family or friends because he could not remember their telephone numbers and nobody could find a charger for his cell phone. 
Um, and I would say, again, talking to my colleagues around the country, frontline providers, as I said, are desperate to know any information about the person and family contacts. And what I mean by that is, you know, yeah, we would love a pulse and advanced directive, but we'll take a name scribbled down on a, the back of a napkin at sort of this point. So really anything we can do to do any advanced care planning, I think is a plus. Um, and so now I'm gonna shift and tell you a little bit about some uh, patient tools that you can give to your clients right now. And I would say that there are probably several people here on the phone that have helped us with these materials over time and helped us sort of pilot test them. So if you are on the phone, I just wanna give you a shout out and say a special thanks for that. Um, but before we get into the materials, I just want to take a quick step back and tell you what I know many of you already know and think about when we created these materials, it was really important that we thought about the health literacy considerations. So as you know, the average reading level in the U.S. is only at the eighth grade and for Medicaid and the elderly, it's the fifth grade. And most advanced directives or documents or any sort of patient education is often beyond the 12th grade or postgraduate reading level. We also have to take language considerations into account. So 61 people in the US or about 20% speak a language other than English. And that includes 40 million Spanish speakers um, as well as 3.4 million Chinese speakers. Um, and there really have been a lack of linguistically appropriate materials as well as cultural considerations. So we know that, that you know, in terms of non-Western views on autonomy and decision-making, that there are about 20% of people that we know in our communities that do not want to make their own medical decisions. So if that's true and they want someone else to do that, how do you engage them in advanced care planning or help them help their own family and their medical providers? So there's a lot of mistrust and real experiential racism. I think to be honest, that has sort of, you know, come even more to the forefront during this pandemic. Um, minorities are given less information by clinicians when there's less time for discussion. And I can tell you that there's a lot of mistrust about these forms. So in many populations, the goal may not be to get people to complete forms, but the goal might be to actually start these conversations with loved ones. So knowing all of these things, we started out with easy to read advanced directives. I will just tell you briefly that we did a randomized control trial so that these are evidence-based forms. We doubled our completion rate and people overwhelmingly preferred this form. What was interesting to us is this was regardless of literacy or language, it means even people with high literacy preferred the easy to read form. Um, it's currently available in 10 different languages in California and it's available in all 50 states, English and Spanish for free on our Prepare for Your Care um, website. So, we're thinking about these advanced directives. And as I said, there are still many people who won't fill them out. And we were hearing from the community that these are great, but there's still some other things that we need help with. And so we were thinking, well, what is that missing puzzle piece? And people, what we heard is that people really need the skills to identify what is most important and how they wanna live. They need to know how they can talk to family and friends, how they can talk to medical providers, how to make informed decisions, so that they can get the care that's right for them. Because the form is the form, and then there's these other skills that they and their family members are going to need if they have to speak up for themselves in the hospital or the emergency room. So that's really where we came to for the prepareforyourcare.org website, which is an interactive multimedia website. It has five steps that walks people through the process of choosing a medical decision maker, deciding what matters most in life, choosing flexibility for the decision maker, telling others about your wishes, and asking doctors the right questions. In creating Prepare, again, we wanted to make sure it was easy to understand, so it's written at a fifth grade reading level. It has voiceovers and uh, has closed captioning, including in English and Spanish. Forgot to mention that it was co-created with diverse populations that helped us actually with the content and the stories that are part of the videos are actually from those communities. Um, the range of video stories include information about people who may or may not have surrogates available to them and for people who might have non-Western views on decision-making. And I think, again, the cornerstone of PREPARE is, are these videos that model advanced care planning behavior. And what I mean by that is we didn't wanna just say to people, hey, you really should choose a decision-maker. We really showed people through these videos 
how they could do that and the words they could actually say. So for example, how to ask somebody to be a decision maker with a video, how to talk with your family and friends about your wishes, how to ask clinicians the right questions to speak up for yourself. And as people are going through the site, it's interactive, so it asks people questions. And if they're not ready to complete an advanced directive, it can create a summary of my wishes. For California, we have the opportunity for people to essentially click a button and it will pre-populate an advanced directive for them. Um, we're still working that, on that for other states, but people can still download the advanced directive for free in English and Spanish in all other states. Um, very briefly, I'll just tell you about the evidence we conducted two randomized control trials. Both of them were published in JAMA Internal Medicine with over 1,400 English and Spanish speaking patients. And when we think about advanced care planning, we can focus on doing clinician training. We can focus on healthcare system change, but we wanted to know how much bang for a buck could we get if we just focused on patients. And if we gave them uh, materials, would that sort of activate them to sort of get this back into the medical record? And the intervention included on one side, we got the easy to read advanced directive. And on the other side, the other group got the easy to read advanced directive plus prepare. And the long story short is that what we found was that over 98% of people in the prepare arm were able to engage in some form of advanced care planning. I'll tell you that for the advanced directive, it was still quite high in the high 80s. So the form itself does a pretty good job. And in the PREPARE arm, we were able to see that PREPARE increased advanced care planning documentation in the medical record from about 8.5% to 43%, meaning that patients had to be activated and motivated to complete these things on their own and then bring them back to their uh, medical providers to get into the medical records. So the reach of PREPARE so far, we've had over 200,000 unique, unique users. And I would say what's interesting is during this COVID crisis, it's a great time for advanced care planning. We've had a 5% or five times increase in traffic to the site that we've seen in prior years during the same time period. Um, free tools that you can hand out to your clients right now um, include our pamphlet and our easy to read advanced directive. And just to remind you, the advanced directive is free in English and Spanish for all 50 states. It can be downloaded right now from the website. Um, for people in California, there is a guided advanced care planning step that will walk people through that process. And we'll, you know, as people are going through, they can, um, if they have questions, it'll pop up videos to show them how to sort of complete the form. Um, and as I said, that there's pamphlets. Um, that trifold um, in English, Spanish, and Chinese that you can hand out to your clients. Um, and um, I'm just putting in a plug for this. We had to cancel all of our group movie events for PREPARE during National Healthcare Decisions Day. But I know of groups and just talked to someone this morning who's putting on these events because you can play PREPARE like a movie through Zoom. And they've had record numbers of people who are coming um, to these group uh, events and, uh, uh, with the movie toolkit and with the videos that can be played on Zoom. Um, so that's another thing to think about your, for your clients who you can't maybe see right now because of um, social distancing. So I also just wanna um, draw your attention to a national campaign that was just launched on Tuesday in collaboration with multiple other groups, including the Conversation Project and national healthcare leaders. We heard from uh, the community that with all the things going on in the news that people are afraid and people are scared and everything in the news about, is about death and dying and what people wanted is some way to feel like they had a sense of control and what were some of the things that they could do now to help them and to help their family members and instead of just focusing, focusing solely on advanced care planning and what somebody might want if they were sick or dying what are some tangible things that people can do? And so we launched this Be Prepared, Take Control campaign, which again is right on the Prepare website. It really focuses on having a hospital go bag and what you might put in that, which includes having the name and telephone number of the medical decision maker, as well as a list of your medications, and then really how to share those wishes with your loved ones. Um, there are some really cute videos that go along with this. This is Dr. Nearling, who's a nephrologist and a palliative medicine physician, sort of talking about what she might put in her go bag. 
And again, all of this can be found on the Prepare website, as well as tip sheets that you can provide to your clients right now, which help people plan for their medications, plan for their hospital go bag, plan for their medical wishes, and also doing things like making plans for your pets and for money and bills. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand this over to Sarah to talk about um, legal barriers and strategies. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so it, Rebecca's work always reminds me um, and has been really sort of influential in the way I've thought about advanced care planning over the years, um, that there are many steps that are as or more important than the form itself. And I think in the law, of course, we're really trained to think about how do we document, how do we document, how do we get the form done? Um, but Rebecca's work um, and uh, our, the work of our dear colleague, Charlie Sabatino at the ABA, um, tells us that really that transactional approach to advanced care planning has not empirically served us well, um, and that we need to think more broadly about um, advanced care planning as a process and there being multiple steps that are still very valuable um, to our uh, patient clients, even if for various reasons we're unable to get um, all of our forms in a row. Um, so with that framing, I'm going to talk about what some of the current uh, barriers are for advanced care planning um across the states so as many of you know um almost all states have legal requirements for completing advanced directives and they were originally passed with the idea um that we needed Sarah, to ensure Sarah, that are you are you sharing your screen oh i am can everyone see it i can't see it but maybe that's just me okay Danielle? i can see it this is ellen you can see it. Uh, can? Yes. Features. Oh. Okay. Okay. As long as other people can see it, I don't. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with mine, but okay. I'm on the common barriers for anyone who uh, common barriers in state laws slide. Um, so really the idea of these uh, legal requirements were to ensure that advanced directives are completed by patients in a voluntary way and that they are uncoerced. Um, and the restrictiveness of these requirements really varies from state to state, um, but most states require at least some form of signature and witnessing um, and restrict the individuals who can serve as witnesses. Um, the specific language of the statute in each state really matters here, so it's definitely worth a deep read if you haven't done that in a while. Um, and in particular, I would strongly caution against using statutory forms to try to understand your state's law, because most states do not require the statutory form, and we found that the statutory forms sometimes contain or imply requirements that the underlying statute doesn't actually require. Um, and so here are why those details matter. Um, some states uh, specify that witnessing must be live and in the presence of the client, meaning that witnesses have to actually watch the patient sign and the signing has to be done synchronously. Um, and this, of course, is a barrier to individuals who are trying to social distance, and it's a particular barrier to individuals who have fragile social networks um, and a small range of people who can qualify to be witnesses or who can all be available at the same time, even by a Zoom call. Now, some states permit acknowledgement, and so you want to look for that phrasing in your statute, and that means the patient and the witness can sign asynchronously as long as the patient somehow confirms to the witness that this is her advanced directive and signature on the document. Um, most states require notarization as an alternative to witnessing, and for some clients, this can be a better option if they have narrow social networks. Um, unfortunately, four states uh, seem to require notarization in addition to witnessing, and this is a real problem, and I've listed them here for purposes of public shaming. Um, the challenge <laughs> is that notaries are required uh, to meet with the individual in person, view their identification, and physically sign and stamp their advance directive. Um, notaries also charge fees, which can be a significant barrier to the population's MLPs uh, served. Um, E-notarization of advanced directives is not currently clearly recognized in most states, but that is evolving quickly, so I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Um, 
On top of these requirements, some states impose additional requirements such as signing statements from healthcare agents or the signature of a long-term uh, long -term care ombudsman for individuals in nursing facilities. Um, and finally, the vast majority of states uh, do not have statutes recognizing digital signatures. Currently, only four do. Um, Idaho and Maine have legislation affirmatively barring digital signatures on advanced directives. Um, and for those of you wondering, there is, of course, federal law recognizing digital signatures on things like contracts and a host of other documents uh, that we all complete online now regularly, but estate planning documents were, ex were specifically excluded from those laws. Um, and again, that reflects a deep history of concern about the potential for abuse of these documents, um, which underlies these restrictions. And sorry, I'm switching between computers here. Um, so, of course, we are in a unique period in history with this pandemic um, in which our calculation of risk is changing for a number of things. Um, and many states are asking their governors to sign executive standby orders to waive or modify regulations or guidance. And this may, and I'll emphasize may, um, include advanced directive law. And we have Randy uh, um, on the phone who has had some success in New York, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more of her update during the Q&A section. Um, so specifically, there's been a push to allow e-notarization of wills and or trusts. So ACTEC, which is a coalition of the estate planning attorneys, um, is keeping an up-to-date chart of this on their website if, you, if you'd like to look. Um, the details really vary by state. Um, and interestingly, e-notarization is authorized for only some documents um, and advanced directives keep getting left out. Um, and so this may be a product of who is asking for these executive orders. Um, this seems to be coming from estate planners and realtors who are thinking about transfers of real property and are not focused on healthcare decision making. So this may be where um, MLP advocacy or inquiry could help get further clarification about whether e-notarization applies equally to advanced directives. Um, the issue for a lot of MLP clients, of course, is that um, they may lack access to technology or someone to assist with technology, and so e-notarization uh, may be a challenge for that reason, or the cost may be prohibitive. Um, this may be where health systems could consider helping, and I've heard of at least one system that is willing to help facilitate and even pick up the tab for uh, notarization. Um, so we are also thinking actively in California about uh, what our governor could do to help ease uh, burden um, for, of advanced directive, advanced directive completion and, and help providers and patients facilitate these. Um, these proposals are an active discussion with various stakeholders, so I will not attest that they are the best or final and in fact encourage your thoughts um, during the Q&A. Um, you'll see that we are debating right now about whether a total waiver of witnessing or notarization is a good idea. Um, I personally have some concerns about that because uh, of two reasons. One, um, these documents for many patients will last beyond the duration of the emergency order. In our MLP, we have a lot of individuals with dementia um, who would be capable of completing a document now, and they should, but in several months when hopefully, possibly, emergency orders are lifted, they will still need that document. They will um, not, though, be in a position to revise it or update it, and if the document on its face lacks witnesses or notaries, we are, um, I am concerned about the practical implications of that. Um, at least for our patient population. So that is one consideration. The other consideration is uh, we're all aware of the uh, concerns that people have about rationing in this environment. Um, and depending on the politics in your community or your state, uh, you may see some backlash or, or concern about complete waiver of all witnessing or notarization requirements. And that would, of course, need to be a discussion you would need to have in your community about whether that's something you want to request. 
Um, so short of total waiver of witnessing and notarization requirements, um, here are some ideas we came up with. In California, our statute already allows patients to have other people sign for them if they are too sick or under, otherwise unable to do so. And so one area of clarification we could request um, would be that the current statute uh, would permit a healthcare provider or other witness to sign for the patient during a telehealth or phone visit. And of course, um, the healthcare provider or other person would have to document on the directive itself that they're signing at the patient's direction and it was done in their presence during a telehealth or phone call visit. Um, secondly, in California, uh, we still need clarification as to whether it, advanced directives uh, can be e-notarized. So California clearly does not permit e-notarization in this state, um, but does has issued guidance to say that we'll recognize e -notary, uh, an e-notary who is licensed in another state. Um, but it's not clear uh, from the language of their uh, guidance that this actually applies to advanced directives and not to other uh, real property or other documents. Um, California is one of the few states that does have um, an electronic advanced directive statute, but the digital signature authentication requirements seem to be quite onerous. Um, and it does not appear that if someone were to create a signature, say using Adobe PDF, uh, that that signature would meet the authentication uh, standards in the statute. If there's anyone on the call who understands NIST standards, please give me a call. I would love to pick your brain. Um, but relaxing the authentication requirements is another way that we could help ease this, um, at least in California. Um, for uh, long-term care residents, and this one also might be controversial, so we're floating it, um, we are looking for clarification that ombudsmen um, are, who are required to be an additional witness uh, for these residents could conduct witnessing via telephone uh, or web-based visits with the resident in lieu of an in-person visit. Um, and finally, that a patient signature could be obtained uh, on a pulse in the same way that we proposed above, that a treating physician could uh, document that they were directed by the patient or legally authorized uh, representative um, to sign for them on the form. Uh, so again, really welcoming everyone's thoughts on this as these are, um, as these are in active discussion. Um, in terms of on-ground strategies, um, I've been thinking about this in terms of synchronous versus asynchronous uh, completion. Um, as I'm sure many of you are, are doing, uh, we're doing advocacy and visits by, by telehealth, uh, by video or phone visit. Um, and so here are a couple of workflows um, that I'll just walk through very quickly for the sake of time. So in a synchronous signing strategy, the MLP lawyer or advocate, the patient, patient and the witnesses are all on the phone or the televisit at the same time. Um, you're talking through the agent, discussing the wishes, um, and then each participant from wherever they sit signs a copy of the form, sends it to the MLP lawyer uh, by photo, email, or snail mail. The MLP lawyer then compiles that into one document and sends it to the healthcare team, who we would very much like to upload or otherwise document uh, in the EHR. Um, now, this, of course, requires a lot of logistics, like being able to actually get everyone on the phone at the same time, getting uh, client permission to have everyone on at the same time, um, uh, and it would require that your statute would give you permission to do it in this way. So there are a lot of caveats here. Um, if the MLP has a notary on the team, that would that's even better. You could have the notary attend at the same time. Um, Asynchronous signing, again, is, is permissible depending on your statute. If your statute allows acknowledgement of a patient signature after the fact, um, you can do this in a more phased fashion. This may also be helpful if you have patients who are very frail or very tired um, or who might not want to have the discussion with you at the same time as their witnesses or other um, uh, or the notary. Um, and in this case, the patient would sign the document 
um, and send it to you and would also need to send it to their witnesses, um, ideally also their agent, so their agent is aware they've been selected, um, and anyone else who um, uh, needs to witness it, acknowledge that it's their signature, and then have everyone sign uh, and return back to the MLP lawyer who is then sending it back uh, to the healthcare team. Um, and this is just another version of this where the MLP lawyer um, would be facilitating e-notarization. Um, again, many, many caveats to this, uh, depending on what your e-notarization um, orders look like or statute looks like. Um, so I'm afraid I can't give sort of blanket advice. It's going to have to be very specific to your state. Um, so. I think in thinking through these different challenges, which I, I think we'll all do together in the Q&A section, I just encourage you to get back to basics. Uh, so again, read your statute thoroughly from top to bottom. Uh, the workarounds are going to be different from state to state. Don't rely on your statutory form for advanced directive law, as they can often be more restrictive than the underlying statute. Um, remember that specific instructions, living wills, are different than the durable power of attorney for health care. Uh, we really encourage, if you do nothing else, to name a decision maker. Um, and what a lot of patient clients have concerns about is the actual living will part. And so if they are not comfortable um, giving specific instructions, then you can encourage them to just uh, complete the DPOA part. And often in many states, the execution requirements for the living will are different than those for the POA. So you, you're, again, your workarounds for each piece will be different. On the prepare form, part one of the prepare form is the power of attorney. Part two is the living will piece. And we design that form uh, so that people can just complete part one or just part two, and the execution requirements are in, uh, I believe, part three. Um, and we tried to make them as, as lenient as we could make them. Um, and then if you have concerns, uh, remember the basic principles, which is that the known wishes of the patient are always entitled to respect, however documented or not documented. Um, advanced directives are just evidence of those conversations and wishes. And so whatever evidence or documentation you can help construct will be helpful, even if, um, as Rebecca said, it's a note on the back of a napkin. I think we can do better than that as MLPs. We're creative, we're flexible, um, and and we can we can certainly help um, our healthcare provider partners and and patients with this. Um, your risk tolerance is obviously going to be up to your professional judgment, um, local law, uh, and your environment. And I just wanted to point out that MLP teams um, should be clear, the, the legal team should be really clear about our ethical role uh, with respect to this problem. You may be getting a lot of questions from your healthcare partners about whether they can or should respect certain wishes and how they should document them. And this is one of those areas where we need to be very clear that we are not risk managers for the hospital or the health system, that we are there as um, advocates, uh, joint advocates for our mutual patients and clients, and that we can provide education um, but we are not there to give advice. And so I, uh, you know, from the perspective of the hospital. So I think being very clear and transparent about that and being clear about, uh, you know, the intention of the education that you're providing will help avoid uh, confusion or miscommunication. Um, let's see. So um, a couple of resources for you. Uh, we developed uh, last year, and it was adopted through an ABA resolution in March, a counseling guide for lawyers, um, which takes the more expansive approach to advanced care planning that Rebecca has described, um, and I think is really helpful guidance now, um, as well as any time you're working uh, with clients on advanced care planning. Um, and so I really recommend that to you. It provides really practical guidance in working through advanced care planning documents um, with your patient clients. 
Um, I would also recommend the ABA's practical tool, um, which is steps you can take in supporting decision making. Um, I will, I think of this tool as the guardianship conservatorship prevention tool. So as many of us know, there are a lot of questions about whether certain um, patients can still make decisions. And this is a helpful, um, uh, provides helpful guidance for thinking through whether guardianship or conservatorship is truly necessary, especially right now when the courts um, are shutting down and impacted. So I highly recommend that to you. Um, and I've been talking a lot about the MLPS legal advocates, but of course, social workers, assistants, and students, um, anyone in the community is encouraged to help um, patients and consumers with advanced care planning. And there are some great scripts here. I think this is from Vital Talk um, about how they can have those conversations, um, particularly in the context of COVID um, and what they can do, the kind of resources you can refer people to. Eric, can I just speak up about this, this one? So yeah. uh, this is actually stuff that we have on the Prepare for Your Care website. And it was actually created so that people who are students, legal assistants, social workers, people in the community who only have five minutes can do something in advanced care planning with the idea that we don't have to wait to have COVID specific goals of care conversations, but we created these scripts so that people don't have to think about it and they could just start the conversation to at least figure out if somebody has a surrogate, at least find out if they have an advanced directive or not, and if not, give them the information about um, our prepare materials. So, um, like I said, this is really for anyone, even if you don't have any um, background in you know, law or medicine. Perfect, thank you so much, um, that's helpful. Um, so that was one of the questions that we had received in advance of this call. So I'm glad that we could address that one quickly. Um, another question that we received in advance of this call was what if people have dementia or COVID specific wishes or directive uh, or wishes not on the directive? Um, so MLP lawyers should be familiar with the idea of tailoring. Um, it's what lawyers do all the time is tailor these documents to a specific uh, patient or client. And so that's something you're already comfortable with. Um, if you're not a lawyer and you're trying to help uh, people complete these documents, um, always know that you, uh, particularly in the prepare form, um, it's perfectly acceptable to have a section that is free form wishes. Um, and we have a section for that in the prepare form. Um, patients always have the option of tagging on additional uh, wishes to their advanced directives. Um, so I think we can talk a little bit about that if if we want to uh, do that in the Q&A section. Um, but I see that we have about a little over 15 minutes left and we'd really like to get to the discussion. Um, so Danielle, what what are the questions that have been trickling in? Hello. Hello. Hi, Danielle. Hi. I think we have, this is Ellen. I think we have Randy available, right? And so, Sarah, do you want to kick it to Randy? Is that? Yeah, perfect. Randy, do you want to launch us in the discussion portion? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Great. Great. I think we all need to mute up, but, but then you'll be fine. Thanks. Great. Um, I just would just give a, a little bit of an update from New York, and then we could sort of start the conversation. Um, in the last uh, town hall meeting that we had, um, we talked about standby guardianships, and I had mentioned that um, that was before the governor's office and hoping he, he would sign, and in fact, he did sign. So um, in terms of uh, doing advanced planning for the future care and custody of children. The standby has now been expanded to include uh, healthcare workers, volunteers in healthcare settings, and then we put in this sort of and other, anyone who believes they've been exposed to COVID-19. So that document has been expanded and is starting to be used in New York. 
And so I would encourage anyone, I, I think there's about 29 states that have standby, so I would encourage them to also, um, to also see if they can extend the usage, use of that document as well. And I guess I would start the discussion by saying that, you know, we don't hear that much from our healthcare workers anymore because they're so busy and they're, they're literally on the front lines. So the advanced planning really has to happen in advance. Um, I mean, I, you know, there may be some conversations going on inside the hospitals and there may be some, I don't know, I'll, I'll ask the doctor online, some most conversations or post conversations, depending how you call them. But I was thinking about what all has to be done before. And of course it's the healthcare proxy and, um, you know, also the living room because we've had lots of people who are isolated have nobody to to decide to make who to make decisions for them so living will in and of itself is important if you don't have an agent um and then also for example i worked on a case where a woman could not get the body of her father out of the hospital because he was still legally married to somebody 20 years ago so we also have a document in New York called the um, Agent for Disposition of Remains. I know it's horrible to sort of, you know, it's it's hard to think about that, but it, it, literally I was on the phone for hours with this woman in the hospital and trying to help her. So I would think about that as well. Um, also, and finally, we have sort of affidavits of cremation, and this is all sort of, I wanted to add to the sort of planning tools that we use naturally. So with that, um, and also in New York, we have had um, healthcare proxies allowed by uh, witnessing remotely, you know, with Zoom and other technology, um, and of course, e uh, notarizations for powers of attorney and such. And with that, I'll I'll stop. I think that's my update. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, one more document. Sorry, there's something called. Um, I don't know, it's sort of designation of person and parental responsibility. And this is a document we have, and I know that other states do as well. If a parent cannot make health or education decisions for a certain period of time, it allows somebody else to do it. And with that, fantastic. I'll open up. Yeah, fantastic. And congratulations um, on your advocacy in New York. Yeah. Really fantastic. Um, is the synchronous signing option available in California? Um, I think yes, but that is one of the areas that we are attempting to get clarification around um, because of course the shift to telehealth has been really dramatic, but in our MLP at least we've been able to um, be creative about that and I would encourage you to also think creatively about that um if you can and happy to to talk offline if, if you'd like to get more specific about that um our next question is an advanced directive or pulse an appropriate place for a client to list they want all life-sustaining treatment how does this interface with physician and hospital determination regarding dnr dni uh, rebecca do you want to take that one yeah i mean I would say in reality, if you hit the emergency room and you don't have any of these, if you don't have an advanced directive or a pulse, you're considered full code um, just by default. That kind of has, has been the default. Though that being said, I think any documentation saying that that is what your goals are, either in a pulse or advanced directive, like I said, when I say desperate for any information about people, it all helps. And I think that that would help a clinician to not have to worry or deliberate or for families to worry or deliberate if somebody's clear goals were listed out in, in a form. I guess I would just supplement that and say that, you know, I most folks think that the only reason to fill out an advanced directive um, is to request withdrawal um, or withholding of treatment, but of course the forms are meant to express goals and preferences of any stripe. And uh, so, you know, and educate your patient clients, family members, not just healthcare providers um, about what their wishes are and their preferences. So I think that uh, is always important information. Yeah, I, I think the other things 
too, to say is that, you know, Sarah and I have done a lot of work on the easy to read advanced directives to make sure that there's more in there than just do you want life sustaining treatment or not? And about the things that are important to you in your life, the health situations that would or would not bring quality of life to your life and other things. Um, you know, I think that, you know, Randy was talking about in terms of where would you want to die and what would be important to you and would, you know, what are the, you know, the religious, um, ceremonies or things that are important to you in your life, if that were to happen, which again, as, as we're hearing, is really important if somebody were to die in the hospital, what are sort of the next steps? So I, I think that um, the reason to consider an advanced directive is because you could have space to talk about more than just life-sustaining treatment. Yeah, and even, um... Uh, even expounding on that a bit further, I mean, we have, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of patient clients in our MLP who are very frail with cognitive impairment, and they may live with some level of cognitive impairment um, or incapacity for years. And so the planning that we're doing for them is not necessarily, it is for eventual death, but is also for how they want to live for the next several years with um, varying levels of being able to um, provide input in their care. And so um, one of the things that I recommend is see if you can reframe it for patients and clients that this is not just about how you want to die, but how you want to live with uh, potential incapacity or just being so sick you can't manage certain things. So um, we have been encouraging healthcare providers to engage in their own advanced care planning. Um, and we've been talking about it as surge planning instead of estate planning, because really, as Randy has pointed out to us, the planning is for your inability to do certain things in your life um, and not just about your death. And that, that Kind of broader framing of advanced care planning might encourage patients or clients to think about it a little bit differently and perhaps be willing to do it. I'm just reading this thing that came in that said in Ventura County, California, we've developed a power of attorney for caregiver or guardian, which our local courts are accepting, a Ventura County power of attorney for the care of children. We have not been successful in getting this made a part of the probate code to be effective statewide, but maybe COVID will move it forward. Great, from yeah. Laura Bartels, Santa yeah. Clara Valley Legal Aid. Mm -hmm. And we're hap I'm happy to provide any kind of technical assistance on getting these sort of standbys um, expanded or even implemented in states. So I'd be happy to. Thank you for that. This is Ellen and uh, Sarah and Randy and Rebecca. I just want to, um, on that score and the concept of surge planning, I appreciate that framing. Um, I wonder, I know there are a lot of states that aren't experiencing a surge or maybe are anticipating a surge, right? And, um, and so knowing that you've gone first and thought through some of these issues and maybe that there are places where uh, MLPs can effectively focus. That was part of what we talked about during the last town hall is if you can't be working directly with clients right now, what kind of uh, advocacy efforts can you engage in? And so um, really appreciate that, uh, I think, message to the field as well, that, that now would be a good time to be um, focusing on some of these more policy-oriented activities that are going to have a huge impact as we go. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and also, the legislatures are open to this. I mean, my yeah. executive order standby was Executive Order 202. I'm sure by this week, it's, you know, there, there's more. So that they're definitely open. And it's a great chance to get in what you need now and maybe um, set the groundwork, something that you could keep going forward. Great. Um, and so Laura, who sent in that question, please touch base with Randy and also touch base with me. Um, and if there's anyone else in California, um, please feel free to get in touch with me because we're actively putting something together right now um, for the governor. So happy to happy to help. And any other MLP that is considering similar activity, um, we could perhaps have a, a separate call or something to coordinate everyone. 
Yeah, we're happy to the help other thing facilitate that, that. Go ahead. I was just going to say the other thing is that, um, you know, we've been talking a lot in our, in our, you know, clinical world about how we often think about advanced care planning as this thing that we need to do for our patients or legal thing in terms of our clients. But I think as we're hearing on this call, like, please help. <laughs> Any advanced care planning, what I mean is talk to your family and friends. I have had conversations with my siblings that I never thought that I would have, that they would never, they knew, they know about the work that I'm doing. And yeah, that was for our mom, but it wasn't for them, but now it's for them. And so again, just even in your own world, like who can you reach out to, to help them do this? Um, you know, I'm shamelessly asking everyone I know to try to help get the word out about our be prepared, take control campaign. Um, happy to send any information about that or just sending people to the prepare website. Um, but, but again, it's sort of like, you know, while all of us are thinking about what we can do and again, clinicians on the front lines are just so desperate and families are so desperate for any information, like any advocacy and policy. Yes. And even like I said, your personal communication with your family and friends, social media, other ways to get it out, please feel free. I think that's such a great point, Rebecca, because um, as lawyers, I know that I've had at least five people, even though this isn't my area of expertise, uh, I've had at least five people in my orbit reach out to me for guidance or help or referral to do some mm -hmm. of this planning just in the past two weeks. And so yeah. I think sometimes there's a do as I say, not as I do. Uh, concept in the legal world, which is, you know, I, I'm going to advise you, but too, I won't, trust me. <laughs> won't take care of my own issues and nothing will yeah. make you an expert faster than taking care of your own, uh, preparing for your own care. And, um, and then I think that does equip you with the tools to be even more uh, of an evangelist for this work. So I, I think that's really great advice. And then, you know, we would ask you to maybe on National Healthcare Decisions Day, share if you made a plan, share what your resources, the resources that you used or relied on, shared about those conversations. I know that's happening on Twitter for sure and, and in people's Facebook pages and Instagram, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that's a great message uh, that we can uh, carry out to our um, sector. So. That's great. Great. Yeah. Any wrap up? Any wrap up comments? We're heading in towards the end of our time together. Um, Sarah, Rebecca, Randy, really appreciate so much your time, uh, your time and expertise, and um, just really valuable. Uh, for all of us and glad that this is recorded so people can uh, access it after the fact. Anything you want to share as we wrap up? Again, I think I would just say that I'm just so appreciative of my partnership with Sarah after all these years and so appreciative of the work that all of you, Ellen, Randy, everybody on the phone that you're doing. It really, it really makes a big difference. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. And same, I think um, it is what MLPs do is educate each other and, and challenge us to think differently um, about our work and take it to another level. And Rebecca has certainly challenged me to, to interrogate the purpose of um, our advanced directive laws and think about how it's serving and not serving um, in particular, vulnerable populations and, and what we can do to um, make sure that we're achieving the real purpose of advanced care planning, which is helping our patient clients have a voice in their care. So very appreciative of that um, and hope that our MLP colleagues out there can find um, similar conversations uh, happening right now. Great. Thanks so much. Randy, thanks for all your expertise. And You're welcome. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank okay. you. Bye.